that we would be here in this moment gathered together. And he could see us from the beginning of time here. So it is a special day, and we thank God for it. Father, we do rejoice in your presence. We thank you that you are a mighty God. You are mighty to save. And Lord, you have saved us. You have delivered us. You've healed us. You've strengthened us. We thank you for your hand of blessing upon us today. And we thank you, Father, for bringing Justin back with us, for letting him have a safe time as he traveled to China. And, Lord, we look forward to hearing of his adventures. And, Lord, we do pray for him as he's dealing with some sickness in his body. We declare by the stripes of Jesus he is healed. And bless him, Father, for taking the time out of of his schedule as he's uh, coming back to life here stateside. Lord, we thank you for for letting him join us today. And we thank you for all of us that are here together, Lord. And we pray for uh, for Margaret and for Dorothy who are not feeling well today. We speak a blessing over them and over their bodies that you bring healing and restoration to them as well. But Lord, as we gather around your table, we thank you, Lord, that your food, your word heals our bodies. Your word is health to all of our flesh. It is life to us. And we thank you, O oh God, that, that we don't live by just natural food alone, but we live by every word that proceeds out of your mouth, Lord. And it helps us to go through these days and to live through these times. So, Lord, we fellowship around your word. We fellowship with one another, and we give thanks unto the Lord, our God and King. Your love, your mercy endures forever, and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, Amen and amen. Well, we're always excited to gather around God's word, and we've been studying in times and where we're at. We were just talking about the fact that God said in his word that the generation that sees the fig tree blossom uh, and bud again will by no means pass away, but will see the coming of the Lord, will see the end of of this age as we know it. So we know Israel became a nation in 1948. So you add 50 years to that, if that's kind of the age of a generation, that would be in the late 1990s. You add 70 years of a generation. We're right at that time. If we take uh, Israel recapturing Jerusalem back in 1967, you add uh, 50 years to that. You know, what is that, 2000 and one or something and you had 20 years we're coming up in that time so we're thinking according to God's word that we should be right around the time we're getting towards the end of a generation that see it because if you were born in either 1948 or you were born in 1967 when that happened and you're that generation that says shall by no means pass away till they see the coming of the Lord we're getting, we're getting older. We're getting there. I was born in, in 1957. So my generation, I believe, is going to see the coming of the Lord. And I keep thinking, come, Lord Jesus. I'm ready. I'm a stranger and a pilgrim in this world. And see? So, so you're right about there. You're on the verge. And so we're believing to see it. Margaret, who just celebrated her 90th birthday, she keeps asking me, Pastor Sandy, when is Jesus coming? I say soon and very soon. Because isn't that um, the very last thing he said in the book of Revelation? Behold, I come quickly. And that's been 2,000 years since Jesus was here and he spoke and spoke those words that John recorded in the book of Revelation that we're studying. And, of course, as Betty just mentioned, uh, the Lord said, one day with me is as a thousand years to you. So his quickly is just a few days, but to us it's many, it could be many, many generations. But he does single it down to one generation that says the generation that sees that, the budding of Israel is going to see the coming of the Lord. And of course, we we know wars and rumors of wars are happening very quickly. If you're watching the news, uh, we're seeing that that China is flexing uh, its military muscles. North Korea is testing missiles, and they just successfully launched a missile that will now travel hundreds of miles. 
and uh, you know the North Korean uh, dictator he has no qualms about uh, he executes those around him when they misstep or misspeak we see um, tensions between um, of course North Korea and South Korea we see China we see Iran and Iraq and all of those areas they're all building nuclear wars and and even testing out in the in the waters our ships are there and they're sending um, small boats right up and and taunting the United States of America so there's of course wars and there's rumors of wars there's famines there's pestilence there's earthquakes there's all kinds of strange weather patterns of course we have those people that think that um, our greatest fear or our greatest enemy is global climate change and the climates are changing there's no doubt about it weather patterns I just read about some um, anomaly of one weather pattern of, of how the winds move and flow over the the earth as a whole that there's some anomaly that has just happened recently that they've never ever seen before and of course we know that because we've never seen it before it doesn't mean it's never happened before but just since the time that they've been able to have equipment that could monitor this so there's strange things happening in the earth we do know that for a fact things that we've never ever ever seen before and reported on so we know God is up to something God is moving in the earth and that's why we come to study to show ourselves approved because we need to be ready we need to be the wise virgins that have our lamps filled with oil so we've been embarking on a study of the book of Revelation and we're going to go through the timeline um, Justin you just got handed some papers we, we're right now at the very beginning we've been studying the seven churches of Revelation and we're going to finish that study today of the churches because the book of Revelation starts out with the Holy Spirit showing John the revelator, the revelator who was was being given a glimpse of all of these end time activities that he was shown that these seven churches that physically existed in early times when the church was being formed and things that were right about the church and things that were wrong about the church and of course it's important for us to study so that we can see corporately how the church is acting today but more importantly how do we as individual members of the church how do we conduct our lives because we know that God is going to deal with each of us individually and what we did with our time here on this earth just like the parable of the talents we've all been given certain talents some may be one talent some may be five talents some may be ten talents God doesn't um, judge us based on the number of talents we were given but what we did with what we were given how faithful are we to take what God has given it and to use it to the best of our ability so we've been going through taking our time looking at all of the churches and it's really interesting um, when we think about that we're going to cover the rest of the church of Sardis Philadelphia and the Laodicea church and see what God has to say to us but I was when I was praying uh, this morning and getting ready for for Bible study and feeling as I know everyone is feeling that it's very easy to get overwhelmed with life it's very easy to get overwhelmed with everyday activity and all the things that that we're involved in so of course what this morning when I was getting up I was trying to get ready for Bible study you know looking around the house seeing all that needed to be done all the things I need to do here at the church you know my other little part-time job that I have and trying to balance all these things begin to feel like I don't have enough time to do all of these things and to do them well I need to do this I need to do that I should be praying I should be doing this and so it's very easy to come under condemnation for how we use our time and those of us like me that are type more type A personalities I'm busy doing something all the time and it never gets done to my satisfaction so I'm always hard on myself because I want to do more and the scripture that came to my mind this morning and I want to um, read it to you because it it helps me when I'm feeling overwhelmed and and 
we as those in the church, when we're looking at the overall picture of the church and we're kind of comparing ourselves, we need to make sure that we don't allow ourselves to get overwhelmed. Because what happens when you get overwhelmed? Sometimes you just throw your hands up and say, that's it. You give up and you sit and do nothing. And I think many not only of us as Christians, but most people in the world are at that place of giving up. So they're looking for just ways to entertain themselves, to take their minds off of working, being diligent and moving forward and just continue to just be busy with things that can take your mind off it. And so the common things that people are doing today are drugs alcohol, pleasures of the flesh. And that keeps them feeling, giving them a euphoric feeling of temporary happiness, but it's not. Our happiness is in the Lord. And, and so this morning when I felt, felt myself getting a little bit overwhelmed of, oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, um, I began to pray in the Holy Ghost. Because praying in the Holy Ghost stirs ourselves up in our most holy faith. And it gets our mind off of the track of I've got to do this, I've got to do that, and uh, I don't want to do anything, and I really I'll just sit down and just uh, turn on the TV and watch something rather than doing what I need to do. So when praying in the Holy Ghost brings God back in, we're to stir ourselves up. We have to stir this gift up in us, and it's like a child when you tell a child, sit down and eat your fruits and vegetables. I don't want fruits and vegetables. I want candy. I want dessert. You can't have dessert until you finish your dinner. They don't want to. It doesn't, it's not always that tasteful, but what dessert and candy and all that tastes good and it's easy to do. But we must pray in the Holy Ghost. We must stir ourselves up and focus on those things of God because then we can be productive. So I was doing that and this was the scripture that came up uh, for me it says, "Thou." Uh, this is Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. I'm going to read that out of the um, New Living Translation. Let's see what where that is. Because I, I want to just spend a few m moments exhorting us on that. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. And so that's what I started meditating on is the fact that if we trust in God and we think on him and trust in him, he will keep us in not just peace, but perfect peace. What is perfect peace? When everything around you is in harmony, in balance. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be perfect because we know that this side of heaven, nothing can be perfect. There's still going to be disarray, disorder. There's still going to be sickness, disease, destruction, calamity. There can be all those things. But he can keep our minds, our person, our being in harmony if we keep our mind on him. And what does that mean, keeping your mind on him? Thinking on those things that are pure, lovely, honest, praiseworthy. Thinking on good things. I don't have to think about all the things that need to be done. Do I need to keep things in order and keep working on it? Yes. But I can begin to focus myself and say, my being, my aura, my surrounding, I'm in peace and I will move forward and I will get things accomplished one thing at a time. I can't do everything. And so I have to talk to myself. And the word of God tells us, instruct yourself in songs and psalms and spiritual things and move forward. So that's what we need to do in our lives. We need to let God keep us in this perfect peace because the times are becoming more and more chaotic. There's a disharmony. There is a disorganization. Things literally are falling apart, fraying, aging. All of these things are happening, but we as the church, as 
the ones living in these end times, we've got to keep our thoughts and minds fixed on him because he will allow us then to keep these minds from going boing, boing, and, and going tilt. And so I want us to focus on that. And then it's, it's very interesting. I wanted to share one more thing. So I was praying on the way down here. I was, I was just worshiping the Lord and saying, thank you, Lord, for keeping me in perfect peace, for keeping everything in balance for me. And so I pulled into the parking lot here at church, and, and I, I just began praying over the church and praying over the property. And, and an interesting wor- I prayed an interesting word. And this is how God teaches me. We need to, part of God's keeping us in perfect peace is relying on the Holy Ghost to show us things. He's our teacher. He's our helper. And he will teach and help us things. And I learn more um, from just things that God gives me than I do. I do listen to a lot of other teachers. I read books. I read a lot of information. So I'm getting that. But God can give me one word and he can reveal things to me. And teach me something just like that. So I was praying, and I began to pray about the church. And um, I don't even remember the phrase I said, but I used the word enclave, which is not a word that I use normally. So that's how I know God's showing me something, because suddenly I'll use a word that I, I have to even look up and to make sure I know what its meaning is. And when I do, I'm always like, as soon as I see the meaning, I'm like, wow. And it's like revelation knowledge pops off. So I looked up the word enclave. And, it said, and I was praying about the church as an enclave of blessing, an enclave of God's glory, an enclave of activity. And that was the kind of the vein I was praying in. I was, I was praying about us stirring ourselves up and the church being stirred up and the church not being a dead church like the church of Sardis because it's easy to get, to get complacent and lax and just to, to exist and, and go to church out of habit but not to have the church as a vibrant living organism that's functioning and flowing and growing and increasing and so I was praying about that for the church and that's when the word gave me an enclave the word enclave and it says an enclave is a portion of territory within or surrounded by a larger territory whose inhabitants are culturally or ethnically distinct now think of that as a church we as a church, are part of a larger church, a larger body. We're individual members of a large body of believers throughout time. Throughout all of history, we're joined to all the other believers. This church is one church of many churches all over the world that belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we qualify, and it says, whose inhabitants are culturally or ethnically distinct. Are we culturally and ethnically distinct? Yes. The church is made up of many members coming from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, but we become one in Christ. And it says we're to be separate. We're not to be part of the world. When we become born again, we become a new creation in Christ. So we're all born as homo sapiens, as human beings, we all have uh, DNA. We're all made up of the same, you know, type of body. Scientifically, they can tell if we're humans. They can analyze our DNA. But something happens when we become born again. It says we become a new creation, born of the Spirit. There is something distinct that maybe science can't analyze scientifically, But all of the unseen realm, God, the angels, the devil, all the forces of darkness, they know who has been born again and who is not. They know that spiritually. There's something that happens. So we are an enclave, and we as an enclave have an enemy of our souls, the devil, who is trying to steal, kill, and destroy and trying to separate us from our group and that's why we have to stay connected we have to stay active so as we study these churches and we looked at sardis uh, the dead church we introduced that uh, last time and if you look at your chart of the seven uh, churches of revelation we can kind of go down and look um, 
and see their commendation is that um, they have the works, but their one thing is they're dead. Their works are not complete, but th they are told to watch and strengthen the things that remain. Remember, hold fast and repent. So we talked about remembering our, our first love and, re and going back to how it was when we first became born again and how excited we were. We need to become alive. And it says that the challenge to the Sardis church that is dead, it says they'll be clothed in white raiment and he will not blot his name out of the book of life. We spent a long time talking about the book of life, and that when we become born again, that um, our names are inscribed there and they're recognizable names. And so what happens to the dead church is you can become born again. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You are headed for eternity. But if you become dead and you no longer stir up those gifts, you no longer um, hunger and thirst after righteousness and, and, and serve God and hear and obey his commandments, that which is alive in you begins to wither and die. Edna and I were just looking at a plant this morning that apparently isn't getting enough water because suddenly we're seeing, seeing it die. And I said, you, you don't notice something is dying until the outward leaves begin to dry up. But guess what? It's been dying for quite a while. Before it gets to the place where, you, you know, you take its little twig and it won't bend anymore. It just, what, snaps? It, that's, a, that's a long process. So that's been happening for a while, but you can't see it until all of a sudden it's dead. And hopefully, you know, there's still some greed in it so we can water it and cut away all the dead parts and it will revive again. And so the church needs to remain alive. And we as individuals, I don't think people recognize. And, and if you've been a member of a church for a long time, and I know all of you have, have seen it, you've watched as people have come into church and they're here every service and they're excited and they talk about God. And then suddenly you, they start missing here and there. Oh, it's just occasionally they miss a service and you don't think much about it. But suddenly it's, it's longer. They're gone one, two, three, four weeks five weeks they pop back in and say oh my gosh I can't believe it's been so long was it was did you is it been since Easter since you've seen me yes oh my gosh I've got to you know and they'll come back you know but then they're gone again what happens they don't realize they're starting to die spiritually they still talk about God they still know the Lord but they're not getting nourished the extremities will start getting dry and pretty soon they're do maybe doing things, going places, doing things that have, you know, that they shouldn't be doing. And pretty soon they don't realize it, but they've died spiritually. And they're going to have to make some big changes in order to revive themselves. And guess what? It becomes more and more easy um, for them to not come back and be a part. Why? Because then they feel guilty. Then it's like, oh, yeah, you know. And, then, and then, then when you know that they're really dead, but they don't know that they're dead, they come back and they come into a church service and we're singing, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and we're singing and worshiping the Lord. And they come in and they go, what? Are they? they're, they're acting kind of stupid. Why are they doing that? And, and it becomes strange to them. They no longer want to raise their hands or want to praise the Lord or is pastor pray, is pastor Sandy praying again I wish she would hurry up um, you know I had someone tell me the other day um, don't be too preachy don't be too preachy preachy, preachy. <laughs> and I laughed and I said <laughs> I and I, I laughed I said that that is who I am you know and and it's because that word becomes an offense to them. It's not a blessing. See, when I hear the word of God and it, and it penetrates my heart um, and I say, ouch, because it's convicted me, like um, I was, uh, and I have to acknowledge, I was making fun of a couple of politicians and I was laughing about some jokes. And the first time I did it, you know, I heard the Holy Ghost say, mm, you shouldn't be doing that. You need to be respectful. And I did it some more and did it some more. And, you know, I thought it was so funny. And I, I heard a name that someone called someone else. And I laughed. I thought it was so funny. And I realized the Holy Ghost was 
zinging me that I need to watch and be respectful. I may not agree with a politician's views. I may not agree with their actions. I may not like their actions and their actions may not line up to the word of God, but I need to watch being respectful. So the Holy Ghost was teaching me and I have to listen to that voice. When someone tells you something that you don't want to hear, you know, it should convict our souls. We shouldn't take it as an offense. We should take it inwardly and say, is the Holy Spirit trying to tell me something? And so many times when people are part of the dead church, they think they're still spiritual because they still believe in God. They still believe they're born again and they are born again. And because they once were excited, they believe they're okay. Because I have many people tell me that I come in contact with. I don't go to church on a regular basis, but, you know, I believe in God. I pray every night. I will say a few scriptures. And I really can't say to them anything except, you know, we need to stir ourselves up. You see, they're justifying their existence, but what are they giving? Like I say, if your hand decides it no longer wants to be a part of your body and it separates itself and it goes and sits over there on the chair and says, I'm not going to be a part of that body, but I'm still a hand. I'm still a living body. I'm still doing my thing. And I believe in you as the body, but I just want to do my own thing. Can the hand live without the body? No, it can't. What happens to that hand? It, it withers and it, and it dies. Why? Because it's not connected to the whole body. The whole body is designed to join itself together and to function. I need my hand. But guess what? My hand needs my brain. It needs my heart. It needs all the blood vessels that flow to it. It needs all the nerves and the bones and everything that's part for the hand to function. And that's why it's really absurd for a Christian to think that the Christian can do his or her own thing outside of the body of the believers, outside of the enclave that God has joined it to. Because God says in his word, I have put you, placed you and positioned you in the body where it pleases me. And it says we are to submit and to be a part. So the dead church, what has happened is not only are individual members of the church dead, but there are churches that have become dead because they've separated from the head. If you're not a part, sep connected to the head, you are dead. And there's many churches that have separated from the head. Who's the head? Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. We are his body. And if you've separated from the head, the head, Jesus, says, I do nothing but what the Father tells me to. So he has stayed part of the Trinity. Jesus didn't do his own thing. He says, I do nothing but what the Father tells me. So when he came to earth and lived, he came and became embodied in flesh and he submitted to the limitations of this flesh, even though he was God himself in, and he was incarnate. He became carnate and lived in flesh. He submitted. But on this earth, he stayed connected to the father. He says, I do nothing but what the will of my father is. And we have to say, we do nothing but the will of Jesus as Lord of our lives. So you can see how easy it is for churches as a group for various enclaves to be separate from the head Jesus and the church itself dies or individual members of a church die because they separate how does faith come faith comes by hearing, hearing and hearing by the word of God when you come to church you should hear the word. Do you necessarily hear the word that you want to hear? No, it's the word that whatever's being taught, whatever's being given. And, you know, over the years I laugh and people say, you know, oh, um, when people get ready to leave a church or to move somewhere else or to do something, they say, I'm not being fed there anymore. I've heard that. I can't tell you how many times where people say, 
pastor's not teaching, pastor's not feeding me anymore. You know, I've heard the same thing over and over again, whatever the reason is. And what happens is, is they've now decided what they want to hear and what they don't want to hear. It's, it's, it's on them. And like I say, I can, if my, if we go back to that scripture that I read this morning, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. If we keep our mind on the Lord and the, on his word, we are going to receive whatever God has for us. And we're going to receive it with thanksgiving and with joy. Um, I've, I've learned, and sometimes I get irritated and frustrated, just like everyone else gets irritated and frustrated about this, that, or the other thing. And I say, God, what are you trying to show me through this irritation, through this frustration? And if I take a step back, he'll show me something about me. What do I need to learn? What patience do I need to gain from this situation? How can I be more compassionate? How can I help more? Why am I judging? See, I, I have to go through this whole process and that's how I stay stirred up and stay, I have to stay teachable. But when we get to the place where we're more angry, frustrated, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's everyone else's fault but mine, you're dying inside. Your mind isn't in perfect peace. You're in complain mode, complaint mode. Everything's wrong with everyone else. And pretty soon you're sitting there and you don't realize you're dying. And that's what the dead church is. And what's scary about the dead church, it says in their uh, condemnation or their challenge, is that, that their names are going to be blotted out of the book of life. So there's many Christians, I believe, today and throughout history who have been born again, but they've fallen away. They have taken themselves out through trickery and deception of the devil and have become separated from God. And they're, unless they repent, their names are blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life. No, I think they still, still believe, but if their hearts have become so hardened and they're not repentive, like I say, only God can judge the heart. So I don't know at what point that is. But I just know that when I read that scripture as a very young teenager, young early in Christ, that, that your name could be blotted out. Because I grew up in a church, I grew up in the Baptist church, and I was taught once saved, always saved. Yes, please do. This is an interesting topic. They still believe in God. That's true because, and that's a good point because it says that a tree will reproduce after its own kind. So there should be what fruit or evidence of salvation. And like I say, we can't look at anyone and to say, to say, oh, you're not going to go to heaven. And, and we shouldn't say that to anyone. We should never judge someone because God judges the heart and the intent. There could be some crusty old person that we think would never have been born again and and was crusty and kind, but he could have he or she could have had a good heart and prayed and done things that no one saw that God saw and and they're saved. We we just don't know. But I just want to share with people that it's a possibility that you can become born again, have a true born again experience and you're not going to make it to heaven. How? I don't know. This is just what the word says. Yes, things. It, and, and just because you go to church doesn't mean that you're saved either. There's a lot of people that go to church that have never truly become born again. Overture? Yeah, you have to you don't be not hearers only, but be doers. They want to do their own thing. Mm-hmm. They don't, they don't want to do God's will. They want to go forth and do their own walk. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens when you say you're going to do God's will. Mm-hmm. They don't want to do God's will. They want to do their own thing. Mm-hmm. They don't want to do God's will. They want to do their own walk. And that's what happens when you say you're going to do God's will. They don't want to do God's will. They want to do their own thing. Mm-hmm. And that's important. We're talking about fanning that flame. 
and keeping that fire going, not being, not being dead, not being just partially alive. But going to church is an act of obedience because we're to come together. We're to serve one another. And, and it is easy. If you work a job, you're gone all week long. You know, Saturdays are filled with chores and things to do whatever. And you've got, you know, kids and you're doing this. It's hard to carve out a Sunday morning and get up and go to church when you have to then get up and go to work and start it all over the next day. But what is that? It's, it's obedience. It's coming to give. Church shouldn't be just the act of even coming into a church and sitting down and saying, okay, I put in my time. Uh, you should be part of a body. You should be giving something to the greater enclave. To be culturally and ethnically distinct, you should take what you have and be giving it to someone or something as part of the flow out because we can study water. What happens to water that flows in somewhere but never goes out again it becomes stagnant water like living organisms has to move and flow it gets it gets mosquitoes it becomes a breeding ground for all kinds of yucky things it dies it, anything that's alive in it other than mosquitoes because mosquitoes could live you know on top of the nasty water but the fish and the life all die there has to be something coming in, something going out. And even the act of water flowing over water and I mean, rocks and, and things, what is, it, what is that? That's a purification. That's an oxygenation when the water flows and, and there's some action against it. It causes oxygenation and purification. And that should be our lives as Christians. When you come into a church and you assemble in a body, does everyone automatically get along? No. You're going to butt heads here, butt heads there. And, you know, this one's in control of that, and that one's in control of this, and they all want to control this little territory. And, I mean, there's things happen. But even that interaction can be part of our growth. What? If we keep our minds on him and learn to say, okay, I don't always have to be right. It doesn't always have to be my way. I can grow. I can have patience. It's all part of the process. And so that's why the church needs to be alive and flowing, and like Overture says, being doing the word. Yes, and pretty soon, how long is it before he becomes number 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15? He keeps getting down lower. And like I say, you can watch that pattern. It's easy. It's not as easy to see it in ourselves, but you can watch it in other people easier than we can sometimes see in ourselves. And we have to say other people's lives are really a mirror or reflection somewhat of, our, of ourselves because we're all human. We all have that human nature. And so many times I'm so thankful when I see when I do see people, you know, living on the street, living in great poverty, I become very thankful because, but for some different circumstances, that could be me. But for some different choices, some different things happening, that could be me. And because we all can experience these downward turns. Sometimes when you read or, or, or find out how someone got to the place that they're at it was a series of steps but we're all just steps away from that same process and so th so that's why we need to stay connected and part and we need to discipline ourselves and of course a disciple is a disciplined follower of Christ we need to continue to work and to progress and discipline these bodies and the dead church is not so that's why we have to look at the dead church the church of philadelphia and philadelphia means brotherly love and that's uh, out of revelation uh, chapter 3 verses 7 through 13 uh, let's go and read through that quickly because i want i do want to finish these churches today so we can move on to the rest of the rapture teaching so let me get my 
Bible open to Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to uh, jump down to verse 7. It says, the message to the church in Philadelphia. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true. The one who has the key of David. And of course, the key of David is the authority that Jesus um, obtained when he got the keys of sin and death from hell when he completed his work at the cross. It says, what he opens, no one can, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can can open. And of course, that's why we need to stay connected to Jesus, our head, because he does have all the keys and he allows us to use them. He's the one that can open doors that no one else can open and close doors that no one else can, can close. Our head, Jesus, operates in the supernatural. We operate in the natural, but God in us allows the supernatural to work. That's why we need to stay connected. Verse 8, I know all things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did, de did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. Are you guys understanding this okay? Because I'm reading it out of the New Living Translation. Um, that's where my version was just set at. It says, verse 10, because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. So this is a key scripture again to Philadelphia, the church that Christ loved, the church that was on fire and not dead and stayed um, connected to his word. Again, we have another scripture confirming that if we're those active Christians that are staying connected and doing our best to do God's word and to repent of those things where we fall short, again, he says, I will protect you from what? The great time of testing, that tribulation, that those trials that are coming on at those times of Daniel, those seven years we're going to be studying, that, that then follows in the rest of the book of Revelation we're going to be studying, it's those times we're going to be protected from. And it says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. So again, the Church of Philadelphia has the best um, commendation is the fact that if we're staying in him, he's going to, our strength can be weak, but he's strong. He's going to give us the keys. He'll open doors for us that need to be open. He'll close doors that need to be closed. He will give us his name and we will be saved and protected from the great trials and tribulations that are coming on this earth. Any questions about the church of Philadelphia? Michelle? Oh, yes, and this is, this is where I went, that he will make us pillars in the temple of God. And after we talked about that, because we had a prayer, and, and, and when I was praying, I was talking about praying about the pillars of God coming forth. And so I went and I looked this scripture up, and it was like, praise God, that that was what I saw, that in these end times, that more and more... Um, out of the book of Hebrews, God tells us to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together so much more so as you see the day approaching. So as things get tough, we should assemble more. Why? Because the body needs to come together, exercise, be strong, be a strong fortress. And so what I saw was the doors of the kingdom are still open. There is still yet time for people to come in, to repent, to come in, to get their names solidified their place in in God's house their name written in the Lamb's book of life <coughs> so there's still time for that but there's pillars being established in God's house 
I believe for me, for my role, that I'm not necessarily out in the world system anymore. I'm to be in God's house preparing, teaching, praying, serving, holding up the, 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 the structure, being part of the foundation. So as people come in, there's strength and there's power and there's safety here. And so people are coming in. And he says, all who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God. And they will never have to leave it. I'm never going to leave God's presence. I have to keep myself stirred up. I have to keep my mind stayed on him. Does my mind want to travel and go and get upset and get frustrated? Yes. Do things want to set me off and I get angry and mad and everything else? Yes. Are there times that I want to sit down and do nothing? Yes. When I look around and see all that has to be done, I don't necessarily want to do it. But I had to remind myself, Sandy, do one thing at a time. And so this morning when I was working, I was out, you know, I'm praying in the Holy Ghost and I'm working. Okay, I'm going to carry this out to the ground. I'm going to put this away. I'm going to get this pile cleaned. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to order my day. And, and I'm going to then trust God to get me to my expected end. Michelle? Right. Yes, she's, she's reminded me because I've got to write that down and I'm working on my website because I've, I've started a website um, called Pillar, uh, Pillar of Light Ministry. And so I've been, Ashley's been helping me working on it and I want to record some of these things. And that was what we said that um, you could either be a pillar in the house of God and be stable or you can go from pillar to post out in the world and there's that old saying, they're just going from pillar to post. What? To find something, but they don't find it because what they're looking for is that peace and safety that only God can give. You know, the, the drugs, um, interesting story about how the devil can steal, kill, and destroy. And Don's taught over the years, that, and he's always kind of used the phrase that the devil will take whatever he can from you. And Pastor Don would say, often it would be kind of a joke that he used to say he'll kill you with a hangnail if he can you know what starts out as a simple hangnail he'll kill you well I read a story the other day about a younger teenage boy I would say he was probably around 17 18 19 years old I don't know but he was still a teenager and he was going out with a woman in her early 20s and she gave him a hickey on his neck and that hickey um, turned out to be a blood clot that formed and it went to his brain and it killed him. And what happened was, was that, you know, think about what a hickey does. It sucks and it pulls the blood to the surface and forms a mark. Well, what she did and think, I thought about it scientifically because I'm a very science person. Okay, scientifically, she sucked so hard and sucked long enough that the blood in a main artery coagulated. Because what happens when blood doesn't move? Blood has to move to carry oxygen. If blood comes out and isn't flowing, it stops and it coagulates. So she sucked it long enough for the blood in that space to actually start clotting. And so then it clotted and then it moved to the brain and caused a stroke that killed him. It's shocking. But the devil is using now anything. What we're seeing, we're seeing all these freak things happening because death is imminent. Destruction, the sa Satan is coming to the end of the time where he's using anything to, to kill people. And so here this young man, you know, they were thinking they were doing some, they were going from pillar to post doing whatever they're doing and death occurred. See, we've got to be pillars in the house of God. In God's presence is the only place there's fullness of joy. The mind that stayed on him, that's the only mind that's going to be in perfect peace. Because Jesus is the prince of peace. 
And that's why when they're out in the world, like we were talking about, they're out in Haman's habitation is what the Lord was telling me. And what's Haman's habit habitation? He was out plotting evil and he was building gallows to hang others. But those very same gallows he built hung him. And that's what the devil's doing. He's having people out there building and doing, and they think that they're maybe going to trap others, that they're going to deceive others, you know, climbing up the corporate wall or selling drugs or, or cheating people when they're buying and selling because the Bible has a lot to say about not cheating people. So all these people out there plotting and maneuvering, thinking that they're going to gain natural wealth or they're going to, you know, get ahead. But what they don't know is they're in Haman's habitation and what they're planning for others, the devil is setting them up for their own trap. And that's why they go from pillar to post and they're finding death and destruction. So again, we don't know that what we have in God's house is our life and life more abundantly. So the Philadelphia church are hanging on to God's word and they are going to get saved from the time of trouble. Their names are going to be written in the Lamb's book of life. They're going to have the special name of God and they're going to prosper. So this is the church that we want to pa pattern ourselves after. Now there's one more church and we're going to finish in the next five minutes. The church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church. Revelation, we'll continue reading in verse 14. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen. And what does amen mean? It is a derivative of, of the Hebrew word emet, which is truth. Amen. When you, when you say amen to a prayer, and a say if I were to pray and you all were to say amen with me, you agree, you're adding your agreement that yes, that is truth. Be it done. Amen. So be it. I put my agreement in. And it says, this is the message from the one who is the amen, the truth, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do that you are neither hot nor cold. Now, I think that describes much of the church today. They're not hot, but they're not totally cold either. But it says, I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. How many of how many of people like lukewarm food or lukewarm coffee? No. You want it to be warm and hot and tasty and fresh. It says, I don't need a thing. There's many Christians that say, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to listen to what someone else tells me. I don't need to subject myself to those practices. Why, they praise the Lord for half an hour. Then they take 10 or 15 minutes and talk about announcements and who knows what else. And then they show pictures. And I don't care about any of those pictures. And then they, the preacher goes on and on and on. I don't need to hear what he says. And then they have fellowship afterwards. Oh, my gosh, I'm too busy for that. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Kind of like the emperor who didn't realize he was naked because he had all the wealth and all the gold and all of the things around him, but he didn't realize that he himself was naked. Verse 18, so I advise you to buy gold from me, a gold that has been purified by fire. Then you'll be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness an ointment for your eyes so you'll be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door. I knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we'll share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the church. There are many Christians, and I think this goes back to, you know, the dead church and what we were talking about and what Justin was sharing about those that are, you know, maybe have been born again or think they're born again, but there's no fruit, there's no evidence in, in their lives. Um, there's many Christians that are out there partying with the world, um, out in Haman's habitation, thinking that they're Christians, thinking that they are righteous, 
but they're serving the devil. Their names are possibly in the process of being blotted out. They are possibly so lukewarm they're going to be spit out of God's mouth. And I was quite shocked about the state of man and what man thinks. And talk, of, talk about being naked and covering yourself with the world's riches. How many of you have heard of a gathering called the Burning Man Gathering? Have you heard of it? Well, my kids had heard of it, and I'd never heard of it. Um, I came across in one of the end-time news headlines that I get talking about the Burning Man Conference where it's it just ended. It was August 28th through September 5th this year. It was held out of Black Rock Desert in Nevada. It was founded about 20 years ago, and I'm going to show you a picture. About 60 or 70,000 people gathered in the desert. So what you're looking at is people camping. 60 or 70,000 people they organized in just a desert place. This is the um, people who do LSD and stuff, right? Yes. Okay. So what it is, it's called the Burning Man, and it's a group that they formed about 20 years ago, and it's a gathering of people supposedly around art. So this, they're just out there in the desert. Well, it's kind of what they put out in the middle is a just a uh, kind of a caricature of of a cardboard man, an art man, a big man, and at the end of the conference they burn this man. But what it is, it's all supposedly art and expressing yourself. Everyone is welcome, but it's gotten so popular and they had 60 or 70,000 people that converged for a week, but it's all centered around drugs and sex. They have they have little communities. So talk about an enclave. They have, within this whole gathering, they have enclaves, as, as the Holy Ghost was sharing for me. And you can go and find out about enclaves that you're attracted to. Um, like one, uh, and I read, you can go on the Burning Man website and read about some that are published. Um, but it's, it's orgies, sex, drugs, hedonistic, there's no rules, there's no, you, you become one with the desert, you become one, and it, 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 it's shocking, because whatever you're gathered in, or whatever you desire, is just there. It's like a rave party. It's a rave on steroids, and now it has attracted, yeah, it's, it's so hedonistic. It goes back to the times of Sob Sodom and Gomorrah, where you talk about the, you know, the people are gathering outside because they saw someone new come in and they were, they were so raucous, they wanted it. And it's become now very popular. Like uh, Mark Zuckerberg, is he the head of, is it Facebook or Google or whatever, but all of these famous people, they went and had places. They spend millions outfitting RVs and, and doing great tents for their people, for their enclave, Hi bringing in chefs from all over the world to, to have specialty food, to wait on them for whatever their desire is. And so, you know, there's some restricted areas that are only so set certain amount of people are let in and groups. And like I say, it's become very popular in Hollywood. I saw one couple they had a picture of, uh, and there's maybe some pictures. Um, you watch in a they encourage, they encourage that, so people can be. This was out in the desert, this was out in the desert and they just had it. Okay. Who knows what they've what they've done. Um, You don't, and I saw one couple that they were dressed as unicorns, so they had they had a big horn, uh, unicorn head on. Yeah, that's not, that's probably, that's yes, well, because they go, and then she had to help, help uh, handheld, and, and I read where there's a whole group of people that dress up like animals, and they act like animals, and 
one person may be the animal, but the other person is the handler of that animal. And so uh, it can get into all of these rituals that we we wouldn't think about, but, but people are doing, again, they're going from pillar to post, seeking after these things because they think that's going to bring them fulfillment. And this, lasts for a whole this just ended September 5th. It was in Nevada, and it, look it up. It's, it's the Burning Man. Just look up Burning Man 2016. They had a whole website where people went to register, and you pay so much to register, and then you can do any number of things after that. And some of the, just what was published, some of the groups that you could find were shocking, and then there's unlisted groups that people go, and let's say you're the Mark Zuckerberg where you, where you create this group. It every year? Yes, it had 60 or 70,000 people there this year, and it started about 20 years ago. And it started in San Francisco, and then, of course, it grew too large for them to, I mean, think about trying to gather. And this, even just the how they organized themselves, they were in like a half circle. It looked like those... Um, things, those demonic circles that they do for satanic activities, how they arranged themselves. And then at the very end, they burn, they burn this man because it's symbolizing burning, burning man. And, and uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Michelle? Oh, th- CERN, you know, the CERN thing? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. And they were doing that. It's paganism and hedonistic. Yes. All of that, and you wonder how it's happening. Because you look at some of the opening ceremonies for the last couple of Olympics have been very satanic and very ritualistic. And it's like, how are they not seeing what they're doing? Well, what they're doing and what they're performing. And like I say, <laughs> heads of state and dignitaries, and they're performing, and people are acting like it's beautiful art. And it's like, that is awful. But people are accepting it as normal. Why? Just like the, the Bible said, they're blind, naked, and they don't even know it. These people that went out there, he destroyed it. And that's, what, that's what's happening is that, and now you listen to our governments and what is happening. They're planning and shaping people because they've decided that we as individuals can't shape and plan ourselves but they are doing they need to do the job um, I don't know if you're aware and then we'll we'll close with this because I could talk about this all day um, the United States of America has controlled the internet we are the ones that when you, when I apply for a website and I give it a name I go by the name but it goes into this place this one central place where they assign digital numbers so that that digital number will get people to to link to my website and the United States controls it we've kept it free we've kept it open we have largely allowed anyone to put anything there's been a freedom of information And, and exactly the point. You go to a country like China, they control what their people access. Because if you can control what they access, you can control their minds. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You hear God's word, you begin to believe, you become a believer, and your mind is transformed. So man has figured out how to brainwash and get you to believe and get you to do anything that is ungodly. And so now President Obama has just signed that we, the United States, is going to give control of the Internet to a group through the United Nations that will be controlled by the world. Again, there will be a private group of think tankers, people like George Soros and all of these people that do these dances and think nothing's wrong with it, and they're going to control. So once 
the internet becomes under world control, guess what? They control what we hear, what news is available. So right now, of course, we've got big political divides between a school of thought here and a school of thought there. They want to get rid of, they don't like the conservative values, the Christian values. They don't like that. They can now control what gets put out there. So people in China, they don't have access to the gospel like we have access to the gospel. So Satan is being given control now of what we think, what we hear. And, and so it's going to be time shortly for God to take us out because like when they built the Tower of Babel, what, what were they doing? They were thinking, we're gods, we control everything. And God said, no, when you get to the point where you think you control everything and you're doing all these hedonistic, satanistic things, you have to be brought down. God says, humble yourself. Overture. They spoke one language. Yes, everything is one. Everything is now we, we communicate to the other side of the world like that. And the, the powerful are getting together and thinking we need to control the masses. And so when they think that they can control the masses, God has to wipe it out. And that's what he did. He broke the Tower of Babel. He confused the languages. And people went to their different enclaves. And, but God kept his word alive in all of these areas. And he always had a remnant that would serve him. But guess what? When the remnant gets taken out, and it says we're going to be the ones taken out, all hell will break loose. Overture? That's right. That's what we just read. We're going to be saved and delivered. He's given us the true power, the true strength, the true wealth, and we need to, it says, hold fast. Right. Hold fast till I come for you. That's why we gather. And that's why he's saying, as the day approaches, gather more because we're strong together with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We hold fast unto you, O God, the author and the finisher of our faith. We thank you, Father, for our fellow believers, Lord, that we can pray for one another, we can strengthen one another, and Father, we do declare we shall hold fast to your word. We shall remain strong. We're not going to be just lukewarm, O oh God, but we're going to continue to fan the flame, the fire of the Holy Ghost, and to stir up that which is within us, and we're going to give it out as you give it back unto us. Father, we give you thanks for your word this morning, and we thank you your angels have charge over us and bear us up and get us through these times. Lord, we thank you for your word. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.